and we're back. Thank you, Funky Pins. I wish it sounded in the Zoom as good as over here uh, at, the stu- at the studio. In fact, if all goes well, you'll have a chance to hear Funky Pins live uh, in the near future when you're going to host the next next event here in Helsinki. And you're all invited. So we've heard a little bit of what the AI thinks of collaborating with us. And we heard the perspective of mushrooms a little bit with the with Eric with the weird fungi hat. And now let's investigate what is the current relation with our own consciousness. Our brain is a mystical organism that constantly creates all kinds of images and thoughts in our head, like organizing a talk show. Taming your mind is difficult, almost impossible. That's why I admit being a biggest fan of Buddhist monks. In Untitled, we try to name, uh, find the names for the future plans by combining art, experimentation and collaborations. That requires our brains to generate emergent, unknown, conscious ac- activities like imagining, creating, feeling, being compassionate and being hopeful. Our next guest is a cognitive neuroscientist focusing on empathy, teamwork and learning. She's also a part of SCOPE, organization that tries to democratize the science for all of us. Let's welcome our brain guru and cognitive neuroscientist Katri Saarikivi. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Great to have you over here. Um, by the way, uh, you've been listening a little bit our con- conversation with Onslow and some fun items. What do you think of all of that? Well, I think it's absolutely fascinating. First of all, um, I didn't think you got a chance to really discuss it, but um, concerning Onslow and AI, they had this text behind uh, here that said that the finding trust between AI and humans is key. And I think that's a super interesting question. For example, from the perspective of empathy, yeah. because trust and empathy kind of overlap. <laughs> oh, so we would need to empathize with inanimate things like AI in order to build trust. Yeah. And how do you make that happen? So. And empathizing with AI, like on slow with a name, mm. it creates a for kind of unknown thing, a, a, yeah. a name and things. It's a, it, that's a pretty, it, it will felt fairly, let's say, weird to have mm. a conversation with this kind of thing. I, I mm. created these images in my head of what Onslow would look like and yeah. so forth. So. And that's empathy in action, using your imagination to kind of picture the person Thank and you. <laughs> what kind of personality they have and so yeah. on. So. <laughs> all right, all right. So so you're studying cognition and, and behavior and neuroscience. Mm. Uh, and this, So tell us a little bit more about your recent research and your, your interests, what you've been working on. Well, we've been investigating how empathy works within the ba- brain and between brains. So we're really, really interested in interbrain synchronization, <laughs> which means that we can kind of, um, our brains can sometimes start working on the same wavelength. At like different reading frequencies. each other's minds or? Well, not really. We just function or at different frequencies. Um, find this phase synchronization or then they uh, they gain power at the same time. It's kind of like what happens when, when you walk with someone, you start walking at the same pace. Or when you have a crowd of people and they give applause, then at some point the applause find the same rhythm. So that happens with the rhythms of our brains mm. as well. Yeah, it's like I think Jung has this idea of synchronization that things start like happening at the same time yeah. like this. Yeah, it's, it's really like, natural. It, it occurs a lot between people. And our brains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, as we are figuring out a little bit the current relations with uh, with the technology or the or the nature. So, you've been studying a lot about thinking, you know, the brain. And mm. so, what do you think about this, our relationship with our brains nowadays? Mm. Yeah, I think we've been starting to have a relationship with the brain uh, during the recent decades because of the advent of neuroscience or cognitive neuroscience. So, the methods for measuring the brain when we think have improved and we've been getting a lot of research about the neural correlates of our consciousness of, uh, and of our mind. And sometimes it happens that people sort of feel that they're kind of separate from their brains, that they say that my brain made me do this <laughs> instead of kind of owning their brains and understanding that your personality, your choices, your emotions, uh, they originate from brain matter. But the problem of the mind and the brain that hasn't really yet been solved. It's mm. uh, Gigantic conundrum. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems so. Yeah, yeah. and, and oh, good luck for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we've been thinking, thinking about imagination, and your future thinking requires mm. imagination. Yeah. So, where does imagination happen in in human brain? So, what what goes on yeah. when we imagine stuff? 
on the mushroom dude. <laughs> Sorry, his name I can't remember. Eric. I, I'm Eric. I'm yeah. super, I really crap with names. But he was saying, he was speaking about the default mode network. Mm -hmm. Sometimes overlaps at least, or is probably the same thing as the mentalizing network. So there's a network of areas in the brain that becomes active when we imagine things. Mm -hmm. And especially the default mode network becomes active when we don't have anything specific to do. So when our attention is not directed at something, then our mind starts wandering. And that is kind of what imagination is. Things pop into your head. You go through different routes in your mind. You uncover new ideas. You think of people. Usually when people's minds wander, they think about the past, uh, the present, the future or other people. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. That's like the basic content of our, yeah. of our imagination. <laughs> you sounded like really simple, like all these things, like I kind of like understand it. But uh, I guess, you know, brain is a very complex thing and our, uh, especially collaborative brain is uh, even more complex. And uh, mm -hmm. so th this uh, picture behind us is, is uh, coming from, the, it's a little bit inspired from The Legend of Zelda. Zelda game, which is oh, like a fa that. fantastic yeah. game. So yeah. if you think about all the games today, how much, you know, the games are like resonating to human brain, mm. like how they are like, are they like similar or what's go going on over there? Well, I think we can find the similarity through this concept of complexity that you mm -hmm. just brought up because the brain in itself is a complex network, <laughs> which means that it's sometimes a little bit tricky to predict. It has these uh, ca causal relationships that are uh, somewhat difficult to map. Um, it's a surprising organ <laughs> and it's difficult to like fully comprehend. We need to kind of slice it into bits to really find understanding and then somehow try to compile the whole from all these bits. Mm -hmm. And complexity in games, I think, is increasing, which is making them more lifelike, more mm. unpredictable, because life is unpredictable, yes. luckily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was, um, I was listening to an interview from, with the developers of Zelda, like the, the coders who, who made the game, and they were saying that at first it was really boring, the game, that you could always tell what was going to happen next. Mm. But then they did the thing where every, you could interact with anything in the world. So they increased the amount of interaction or possibilities for interaction in the world. That increased the complexity and, that in, uh, in, uh, and then this unpredictability and, and these surprising elements ensued. And that's one of the things that I personally love in the game, that I can, I can do anything mm. that I can imagine. I can yeah. uh, like run to that tree and chop it down and, and take it to the river and, and sail down the river with the, with the log. I've actually done this in the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody, you should play Legend of Zelda. It's you just should. Like, it's, it's, it's good for humankind. So uh, now... Uh, to create a game or create a story or uh, create an, an idea of the future requires quite a lot of our cognitive power. Like, let's say, this, you know, we need to be able to like cool down and or like, and then just like unpredictable things happen in our brain. So mm. what about the metaph metaphysical ideas that we have in, in, in human life? You know, the, the soul or the, the hope or, or despair mm. or these things, where do they locate in the brain? What, mm. What's going on over there? Yeah, well, the way that cognitive neuroscience approaches what happens in the mind is recording the brain when that thing is happening in the mind. So, for instance, if we have certain, we can put people in a brain scanner and then induce feelings, show them, for example, a sad movie and then, then see which parts of the brain light up when there is sadness. And there's actually a lot of overlap between the basic emotions in the brain. So they're not that distinguishable as we feel that they are in our own experience which is an example of sort of perhaps the limits of current neuroscience, that there, is, there are a lot of parts of our subjective experience of the world that we can't measure, or at least we can't really explain them with the measurement. It's not really saying anything that, well, when you're happy, these parts of the brain activate. Mm. That's kind of like, well, nice to know. But maybe going deeper and, and trying to understand what is common between these, these networks and brain areas, we'll find some more explanations about what the emotions are mm. <laughs> and mm. why they're there. But the yeah. meaning of the emotion, that's totally personal and subjective. Yeah. In the context of like, uh, trying to understand the future, uh, it requires this empathizing about these things. You know, need to create a scenario and stuff. So, so and in our audience right now, especially in the Antarctic Festival, the dreamers and doers over there, uh, they really are thinking about hard about the future. Mm. You know, what could it be better? So do you have any advice to people who want to like, think about the future, what they mm. do with their brains? 
in that regard. I think that one of the challenges for imagining and being creative today is just this overload of technology that we're we're kind of we're teasing ourselves with constant focus and engagement with something. That means that if we're constantly focusing on something, whether it's it's a selfie or oh that thing thing is bleeping or oh I need to go play Zelda even, and we're never in a situation where our minds can wander. So we'll never be able to kind of hear the or the silent ideas, the the weak signals won't have the chance to pop up in our minds if we're constantly engaged with something. And people have been saying that uh, they've lost the patience to you know even read a book. And I've also personally felt that that currently I need like two two inputs at the same time to somehow feel content. I need to be cooking and listening to the book at the same time, or mm. or looking at a, or listening to a podcast and looking at Instagram at the same time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah I can imagine. My, my son was actually the other day was uh, playing uh, FIFA football yeah. game, watching Netflix and watching TikTok at the same time. Yeah. So there's an overload of stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, we we'll built this tolerance for constant stimulation and we need to get rid of that somehow to have more space for mind wandering and imagination. Yes, I totally agree. I totally agree. So, uh, Katri, thank you so much for visiting us thank in you. our talk show. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's truly a pleasure to uh, discuss with a person who can uh, speak about so complex things in a very, very articulate manner. So I, I kind of like understand on this. <laughs> even though I'm like very much on on the like high high pulse right now. So uh, even with the mushroom, <laughs> even with, especially with the mushroom. That's why we understood each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. So uh, thank you, Katri. Thank you. And uh, we'll go on with the, with the show. Okay.